Hi, everybody. I'm Daniel Berwin. Welcome to Reinventing the Graphic Novel for the iPad. Um, super honored to be here. A year ago, I saw Greg Rucka and uh, Robert Rodriguez speak on the stage, so it's kind of cool to see it come uh, full circle. So I'll just dive right into it. Um, so who I am. Uh, my background's in graphic design and video games, so that means that I work at the intersection of art and technology. Um, and I want to apply my unique background to tell a story of historical significance. So I'm going to spend some time sort of talking about um, a cultural framing of uh, what the work that I did is, and then do an actual case study of CIA Operation Ajax. And at the end, I'll have, hopefully have about 15 or 20 minutes for Q&A, and I really hope that um, my, my presentation today leaves you guys with a lot of uh, questions. So um, not everyone necessarily knows what this is. I'm going to show the trailer first, since it can be difficult to describe what an interactive iPad graphic novel is, and then we'll go from there. Introducing Operation Ajax for the iPad, based on actual events of the CIA's involvement in overthrowing the Iranian government. A bold and original interactive graphic novel that redefines digital comics and the art of storytelling in 210 handcrafted pages. Navigating the comic is easy and intuitive. Tap or swipe to read the next page or to go back. Touching the middle of the screen gives you more control and lets you dive deeper into the rich history surrounding the story. At the bottom of the screen, we can flip through pages. It's also easy to jump to different chapters. A handy guide can be called up to provide a synopsis of the cast of characters. Occasionally, you'll see a star while reading. Touch it to pull up additional information about key story points, historical documents that have only recently been declassified, and even newsreels from the era. Operation Ajax by Cognito Comics. Experience it at the App Store. Cool. So, uh, anyway, thanks. Uh, that's our product trailer, but I feel like that really kind of gives you guys at least a teaser of what I'm going to be talking about uh, next. But more on that later. Um, for now, I'd like to direct your attention uh, to this. This is a Stradivarius. Uh, it's an extremely rare violin. Um, even if you had the millions of dollars it would take to potentially buy one of these, um, there's only about 650, according to Wikipedia, uh, that are around in the world today. And the reason I, um, I want to use this as a metaphor for the topic of my presentation today is that um, when I think of the world of media, you know, before there was recordings, there was performance, and uh, there was a sort of artisanal handcrafted quality to everything we did as storytellers, as performers. And the Stradivarius kind of sums up, I think, the epitome of the, the valuable, unique, handcrafted analog past. Um, and so let's say you wanted one of these today. Well, fear not. Uh, 3D printing technology has actually made this possible. You can now, according to The Economist, 3D print your own uh, Stradivarius. And I think that's very interesting because we're now seeing digital technology allowing us to infinitely duplicate um, this handcrafted analog pass for all of our media. And um, supposedly this actually sounds uh, pretty good. Oh. not bad for something you can theoretically download off the internet, right? Uh, so the question I want to propose to you guys today is, how do we honor and maintain the value of our analog, tangible past in the age of digital media? And that's just sort of a question to kind of keep in the back of your heads. It's something I've been asking myself a lot over the, uh, you know, the time I'm spending on uh, making comics uh, for the iPad. So while we're on the topic of music, I just want to sort of do a little mini case study on this really fast. Um, you know, music as, a, as an activity uh, was very different back in the day. I remember, you know, the Maxell advertising. You used to actually sit down and, and devote your attention to listening to music as if it was this, like, activity. Um, and I think that really relates to the fact that our music was a physical thing, you know? You would put on your CD or your tape, and you would actually be beholden to the experience that the artist had created for you. And this really fundamentally changed when we went digital uh, with the um, iPod, right, and the whole MP3 revolution, because now we're controlling the experience. We want to have our music in a certain order, and the music is no longer physical. You had that 80 gigabyte hard drive with like a billion songs on it, and your friend would come over, and suddenly you'd like swap and like instantly have twice as much music. And it was like this hassle to organize your iTunes library. And we didn't even want to do that anymore. Now music has gone to a service, right? You just type in the name of things you like, and a computer's like, oh, maybe you'll like this. 
this, or maybe you'll like that. And I find that a very interesting evolution of, of media in music because we've gone from tangible to digital to service. And our relationship with, this, uh, with music has changed fundamentally because of that. Um, if you think about actually putting on a record and sitting down and listening to it, uh, that's a dedicated activity that we don't really do anymore. I don't know when the last time is any of you actually like put on music and sat down and like intentionally listened to that album all the way through. I mean, I like to do it. I pour myself a cup of bourbon and like sit down in front of the hi-fi, but I'm like a random weird dude who does that. You know, music now because it's digital is something we consume, you know, in the background on headphones while we're doing a billion other things. And I think that's really uh, just something that's happening with all of our media. It's all kind of going into a service-based format, right? Games are going this way with OnLive, TV with Hulu. You know, I remember when TiVo came out and like nobody got it until you used it, and you're like, wow, why would I ever like schedule my time to watch TV after that? And then, of course, movies and music are going that way as well. And what I find so interesting about all of this is that we're consuming these services, all of our media services, uh, on our phones and basically the same place we're doing all of our communication. So suddenly all of our attention is being divided up into smaller and smaller pieces um, where we're also constantly getting texted and we're doing social media and push notifications are happening and we're playing games there. And it's just, it gets us to be this really cacophonous, noisy, crazy space um, where all these things are constantly competing for our attention. And it's a real departure, I think, from that original image of the Maxell guy uh, sitting down and devoting all of his attention on one thing. And of all of the media formats that cross over into digital, um, the one that I think is the most sort of uh, profoundly anti this culture is the book. Yay, books, right? I, I Googled books, and this is like the first image that popped up. And I'm like, of course, that's what exactly what I was looking for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting when you go on vacation, you take a book with you to unplug and to get away from all of the distraction and all of the noise of our lives. And there's something inherently sacred about that. You know, there, Andrew Stanton just did this TED Talk on story that was phenomenal, like in February, if you guys saw it. And he talked about how you have to make the audience uh, work for their lunch, so to speak. And I think that books are really sort of the epitome of that. You know, you have this limited language of 26 characters, I guess, in English, right, plus uh, punctuation. And you have to really focus on what you're reading. It, you can't really divide your attention up while you're reading. You might be able to listen to music and watch TV and play a game all intermittently while you're tweeting and doing what else. But, but books are really the opposite of that. And I think that there's something kind of romantic and sacred um, about that. So I see, I see books as the opposite of, of noise and distraction. Um, and so... You know, books have gone digital. It's not like this is news to us. Um, I think it's very interesting that Amazon was the first, uh, the first company to try to do this while really respecting and embracing that, that past of the sacredness of the page, so to speak. You know, the Kindle was successful because of what it didn't do. You know, you couldn't browse email on it. You couldn't make phone calls from it. You couldn't surf the web. And I think in a way that's why it worked. That's why, you know, the Kindle is successful. It's, uh, it goes digitally carefully, and it, it's really good at maintaining that, you know, that book experience. And then the iPad comes out. <laughs> and here you have the same culture of the phone now trying to do books as well, and things are starting to converge like crazy, and it's nuts. And it's not necessarily bad. I, I think it's more interesting, more like a science experiment. You know, you see uh, little kids. He's, he's flipping you the bird. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, anyway, he's, <laughs> I didn't even notice that until I was rehearsing, and people were like, did you know? And I'm like, eh. Um, but kids' books especially, right? You're seeing, like, animation and interactivity and all these new formats starting to cross over and intersect with each other. And it's happening really fast. And it's, it's a fascinating space to watch because there's no right way to do it yet. And I don't even know if there's a wrong way necessarily. There's definitely uh, apps that are more successful than others. This is one of my favorites. This is uh, Bobo Explorer's Light by Game Collage. And I don't know if you guys have gotten a chance to play this one yet. I say play because um, you actually control this little robot and you do these like interactive um, experiences to explore the physics of light. And it's really cool. And what's so fascinating to me about this app is that it isn't just like that's the only part of it. There's these pull-down menus with like videos and text and images. And you'd think that would be great for learning. And yet when you contrast that with the actual interactive sections of making this robot like play with laser beams and stuff, it's so boring. Like you don't even want to deal with it. You're like, oh, I'm glad you threw that in there so I feel good paying my $6 for this. But really, you just want to make the robot like shine lasers at things. So um, it definitely shows the contrast, I think, between the old and the new when it comes to how to, uh, to learn about a concept. Um, I think everyone here knows more is less more by now, right? They just won an Oscar for their short film. And, um, you know, again, a very successful way of taking a very rich story and repurposing it in sort of the app space and, and leveraging all that is film and all that is books and, and, and so on and so forth, um, like having a piano in the middle of the story. 
Um, this is one of my personal favorite games. Everyone here knows Sword and Sorcery, I hope. This is by Cappy Games. Super awesome. The character carries a book on his back, and you can pull it out, and then when he takes out the book, the whole screen says, rotate the iPad, and suddenly you go from a widescreen game experience to a book experience where you're actually talking through Twitter posts. It's so meta, it's, it's crazy. But um, I really appreciate uh, when creators actually take a conscious step towards this stuff and do a good job. And so uh, it's sort of like taking the ultimate media consumption device and then going up one level, right, with the advent of the book. And it's evolving so fast, there isn't even language to describe this stuff. And I guess what I want to offer you guys today is, you know, thinking as media creators, as people who work in this industry, how can we, uh, how can we actually uh, add value to our media when we go digital? So I'm going to take another little case study here. Um, I'll talk about photography for a second. Uh, so <laughs> I serendipitously hit puberty the same time that America Online became a thing. And so that means that I ended up just doing online dating because it just happened to all match up randomly when I was like 13 years old. And you'd be chatting to like, you know, like women who didn't go to my high school or junior high, like on the internet via text. And it was, um, it was fascinating. I really, really enjoyed it. And you had to eventually, <laughs> you feel very popular. I don't know. You can be very eloquent when no one knows what you, what you look like, I guess. But they, then they would ask you for a photograph and you're like, oh, that's that's a very odd request. How do I give you a photograph over the internet? And you would like rifle through your box of photos and you hopefully had that one really good one and then you'd have to like find a scanner and get it onto the computer and it was just a crazy clusterfuck of how do you send someone a photo. And you maybe had like, you know, two if you're really tech savvy, right? You know, everyone had their one photo. Um, but now photos are, are viewed on screens primarily through Flickr and through, you know, Instagram. You know, everyone is carrying a digital camera with them at all times. And so now that photography is being shown on screens, how do we embrace that? How do we actually, uh, you know, take advantage of the fact that we have a digital um, display backing our photos? It's very tempting to, like, throw in all these other things that would fundamentally change it, but I think you can actually do it well. Um, but sometimes not that well. This is a, a cinemagraph. Um, these are getting a lot of press right now, and there's a whole different version of these. It's this new experiment. And there's ways to be successful, and there's ways not to be, just like with anything else. Um, this, to me, is very distracting. I think that uh, this is um, it's kind of destroying the essence of the photograph in a way. I can't ignore this. I have to stare at the constant stream of repetitive taxis. Um, but more than anything else, there's this sharp contrast between the frozen people crossing the street and the stream of taxis that's kind of a little bit uh, confusing, right? But let me offer you Exhibit B. So I, I can see there's a pretty profound difference here, right? You know, I mean, it's the same idea having a taxi cab going by, in, you know, in a photograph. But um, this to me is actually really beautiful and actually really eloquent. And I think that when it comes to making a photograph come alive, this is a really successful way to do that. Um, as an art director, what I see here is that you know the stuff that is static is it makes sense staying static, and the things that move make sense moving, and they're they're ignorable, right? And so I can give it my attention if I want to, just like a real photograph. Plus the taxis are reflections, so anyway, there's all these layers you could go deep with that, but that's just an idea of how if you introduce motion, just like any other tool to the photographer now, this is one other way to make photography uh, successful in the digital space. So we can add value in the digital space. It can happen. So I'm going to talk to you now um, sorry, about the origin story behind Operation Ajax. Uh, so in 2002, when we went into Iraq, um, I personally was left asking a lot of questions. And I didn't feel like I was getting the whole story from the media. Um, and then I found uh, Stephen Kinzer's work through my parents. Um, I read a book called Overthrow, and then later All the Shah's Men. And it was like, it just blew my, my brain open. I, I found all these stories that were so important to me that I, I was like, wow, this is how we, you know, this explains all these missing um, pieces of the puzzle that aren't being discussed in the mainstream media. And that's sort of a whole other topic, so I won't go too deep with that. But suffice to say, I got really inspired, and I said, wow, how great would it be if I could leverage my background with art and technology, and instead of telling stories about Tony Hawk, um, if I could actually you know, tell stories about um, you know, these, all the Shah's men and all these other countries we've been involved with. And at the time, this was the console era, so games are going to cost you millions of dollars and you know, arguably are still struggle to do a narrative today. So it did, I didn't think that games were going to be the best format uh, for presenting the story. I needed to do a narrative. Um, I had left Activision recently. I was teaching. It was kind of the perfect time to try to take on something new. And so I figured maybe a graphic novel would be something cool. Um, and it was actually this book that uh, changed my view towards that format. I discovered this book. This is Torso uh, by Brian Michael Bendis. So if anyone here is a comics fan, you're probably well aware of who he is. Um, he did this book in 2000. 
And this book fundamentally changed my view of what comics could be, uh, especially with a graphic design background. Um, I'll show you a couple pages, but I had grown up with Marvel and DC, sort of, you know, comics, uh, sort of superhero stuff. And here was this true to life, you know, a spy thriller from the Prohibition era done in like completely black and white. And these guys just indulge like crazy. This book is super thick, and it's like every composition is across two pages, and there's all this negative space. And it was like no comic I'd ever seen before. And they had taken actual uh, you know, newspaper clippings and put them right into the compositions. And um, it wasn't exactly true to life. It was very much inspired by, but it centers around Elliot Ness and um, a serial killer. And so they use actual artifacts from the Times to sort of talk about this story. And I, I found this book to just be profound because I never thought comics could be, you know, could look like this. Um, so I really, I really like when you can indulge and, and break up the experience and really play off of, you know, what the comics language can do when you are free to experiment. You know, this is kind of interesting because here the comics are flowing sideways. You'd actually have to turn the book, you know, to to read the story. And as uh, as it gets more and more intense, there's this crazy like descent into madness spiral that happens. But I don't want to ruin it for you. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, <laughs> so we ended up creating two products. Uh, we first started out to do, doing a uh, fully uh, traditional uh, print graphic novel, and in 2010 the iPad came along and totally changed the whole thing. And what that ended up meaning is that we did a 210-page historically accurate book and an interactive iPad experience, and we were going to need assets that would satisfy uh, both of these products. So coming from a games and animation background, uh, jumping into comics for the first time, naively assuming that it was going to be easy, uh, I had a lot to learn. <laughs> it's a completely different industry, completely different rules, and a completely different culture. Um, obviously, making games um, is different than making comics. And uh, let me present to you uh, this team that made uh, Deus Ex uh, Human Revolution in the top left, right? It's a team of like 60 people or so uh, versus the guys who made Watchmen in the bottom right. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's, a, it's so, there's so many different layers to this, but re- what it really boils down to, I think, is ownership. Um, you know, comics are made by people who really who can take full ownership over uh, their part of the process. If you are like Craig Thompson, you can do the writing and the art yourself and take six years, and it's a true expression of your, of your creative drive. Um, if you're a commercial artist on a team of 60 people making a video game, you know, the mentality is very different, and you're willing to make, I think, certain sacrifices uh, just because you're part of a team, and, and that's just how you know, it works when the budget is $50 million dollars for one of these things. And so that was really hard for me to, to get at first. And it took a long time to, to really embrace that and to figure out how to let artists be artists and still leverage all that's great about you know, uh, a digital workflow and things like that. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, what I think this means uh, ultimately is that comics at their heart are artisanal. Uh, they're really you know, beautiful works of art, and uh, there can be a real struggle, a real disconnect, especially in the world of, of mobile software, I think, between something that's artisanal and something that needs to be iterated quickly and you know, it tested and experimented with and constantly chopped up and played with. So they're two different cultures for sure. Um, I had to learn some basic rules of comics. Uh, Scott McCloud's book was super instrumental in helping me out. I remember I saw him at um, Comic-Con a while ago, and I actually got his attention for a while, and he told me that everything I was doing was wrong, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was nice to, to at least have him take a look. But some of the basic rules here were really simple for the most part, right? With American comics, you go left to right, top to bottom, six panels on page average, uh, when to use insets, when to use splash panels, that sort of thing. But the key part of comics language uh, is the page turn. It's like absolutely critical to how comics work. It's just, you know, printed books, comics go in that, and therefore... As you're reading a story, there's this natural pause where you have to turn the page. What that means is that there's, you have to end every page on a cliffhanger, and the structure of the page is like a key pillar to comics language. Um, to show you a couple pages from Ajax, this is a, these are just some inks to kind of keep it clear, but um, this is four pages, a two-page spread in the middle, and the gray dots are the start and ending points, which is probably no duh for people who read comics, but just to sort of talk about this, there's a rhythm here. So when you end on the first page, you have Avril Harriman stepping out of an airplane with this big kind of like, what next, right? And then we cut to a reverse shot of him uh, on the next page to try to continue that arc. And all hell breaks loose. There's a lot of uh, angry protesting Iranians uh, out there, and uh, the, the whole thing kind of goes to hell. And Avril Harriman has to like jump into this car, and then you're, again, you're left with this what next moment. And then we cut to him inside the car, peeking out the window, and Truman gets this uh, telegram from him saying that it's just all been a huge failure, and then forlorn Truman looking out the window. And so there's this rhythm of like what next, what next, what next. And um, what's so fascinating to me about this is that when comics go digital, one of the first things you have to sacrifice is the page. 
um, this is sort of that same uh, same movement with a little bit of like an NHL or, or sorry NFL uh, you know play by play. You have the red dots that sort of show the rest points and the green arrows connect you between them. And so this is sort of how your eye would travel over those uh, those printed pages. And so, like I said, this is really a challenge when you want to put um, a page of comics on a phone screen, for example, right? Um, you suddenly lose this major pillar of how that whole thing works. And there's different ways to work around this, but what you're ultimately left with is a presentation issue. Uh, text doesn't seem to suffer this so much because you can reflow text infinitely and it all reads about the same, but comics are really key to, uh, you know, to relying on that page structure to be successful. I'll show you an example of uh, how Marvel has tried to, uh, to do this. So everyone should be familiar with the Comixology app. They kind of made this sort of presentation uh, uh, popular. But this originally came from a uh, sort of phone mentality where you kind of go panel by panel, and that allows you to have hopefully the best of both worlds, sort of. You know, you can try to, uh, I don't know, at least see what's there and make it legible. And it's kind of a sacrifice. You get the portability in the small screen, but the trade-off is that you, uh, uh, you know, take the comics with you. That's uh, one way to do that. It really comes down to how you want to present your content, and that's one of the downsides of, uh, of putting stuff on a phone. Um, then the other side of it, just like with the cinemagraph, and you could really retitle my entire presentation, how to add motion to comics without making them suck, but uh, <laughs> comics at their core are reading experience, right? So there's no spoken dialogue if you're going to add sound. Uh, comics allow you to advance the story at your own pace, so not a video experience. How ma- uh, most people are probably familiar with motion comics here, right? Yeah, okay, I'm just going to show you an example, and I'm kind of cringe a little Tell bit. Me, which stage of grieving is this? Denial. <laughs> Strike your nerve, Summers. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> The guy who's tried to steal my wife since Comics. the day he met us is going to tell me all about what's proper. The only reason Gene All right, well, anyway, you guys get the... I don't think he was too yeah, All right, so enough of that. Sorry. Uh, we didn't want to do that. We really wanted to just avoid that at all costs. And I think that when you describe what we do as a motion comic, that's why I get a little, like, icky, because that's, you know, that's people coming with film language instead of comics language trying to make something new and add motion and add sound. Um, I can't say it's a hard and fast rule, but I found that most people who do motion comics or motion graphics houses give in the comics assets, and they go, oh, well, if we're going to add motion, we should make animation, and that's not really the whole point of that. Um, So we wanted to find a solution that um, would allow us to add motion and sound uh, to a comics presentation while respecting the rules of comics, and that's really what I want to talk about uh, next. And so our workflow for doing Ajax is really not that different. Um, like I said, it's a 210-page book. Um, so we thumbnailed out everything. My writer came from uh, uh, animating, uh, animation and, and animated film, and he was able to thumbnail out all this stuff, which is really helpful. We go to a layered ink, and then we finally color and letter everything, which probably doesn't look that different. Everyone here is probably like, well, that's obvious, right? Um, there's one key difference with our art. Um, every page is broken into panel, and, and every panel is broken into pieces. Um, on average, about five layers, not including the, uh, the text, right? And if you think about an average of, say, five panels per page, uh, that comes out to about six to 7,000 pieces of art for the entire book. Um, this is that same page you saw before, fully colored and lettered, right? It's really one of my favorite pieces of artwork. It's very beautiful. Um, if you actually break this apart into pieces, it becomes these texture sheets. Uh, so you can see all the elements of a single page from Operation Ajax. Uh, looks like, well, it's actually four of these for that. So you can see all the pieces here. So needless to say, that was a lot of work. So that's two pages out of 210. And so uh, we had a lot of challenges with this. We had to use a team-based illustration approach, which gave us the best of both worlds. Uh, This gave us reliability and speed in exchange for a consistent visual style. Because one of the downsides is that if you're using a single artist, you're you're limited to how fast that artist can go. And again, it's that struggle between making a mobile product or a digital product, right, with the game's background versus the artisanal approach uh, with regular comics. Um, So we mitigated uh, the consistent visual style problem by using the same colorist across every page um, it took three years to make the 210-page graphic novel and two years alone for the script. And I think that's just a testament to how important the story is. That was a real big lesson uh, for me. So I'm going to go ahead and switch now to show you guys uh, some of the, uh, the app. So I'm going to pop the audio here as well. So here is the app, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time just showing you some of the sound. So as you tap, notice that the music changes ever so slightly.
And so the subtlety really adds a nice cinematic feel. So it's a combination of sort of music, sound effects, and using them really intentionally. Let's look at the animation next. And so here, as you see, we're introducing one panel at a time. And it's very intentional, it's paced, uh, but it only goes as fast as you tap forward. I'm sort of speeding through it here. You can hear certain sound effects will come in and add sort of punctuation on top of an ambient uh, sound in the background. It's a very subtle approach to creating a cinematic reading experience, so to speak. We really want the, uh, the words to come forward and the sound to sort of support that and the motion to support that. And so it's not really about overwhelming it with too much motion and too much sound. We talked about Ajax being built in a game engine, and it's very hard to tell, but at the very end here, as the paper sort of rolls off the screen, you can see that it's actually 3D objects. There they are, rotating ever so slightly. So we didn't push that much in the app, but there is an opportunity to do that, I think, going forward. And as we mentioned before, there's uh, supplemental content throughout the book. And what you'll see here is that you can actually find supplemental content right on the page in certain moments. And so here, a star is going to pop up right at the end of this typewriter section. If you tap on it, you see supplemental content pops up right on the page to give you that sort of departure, that tune drill down, so to speak, where you get to go check out uh, certain extra pieces of information while reading. There's a roster as well. We changed character artists every chapter, so we wanted to refresh your memory of who the main people were, and so you can just call this up quickly to find out who the Shah was, or who Ayatollah Kashani was, or Mossadegh. And my hope is that with this, it really uh, keeps the reader informed. So next we're going to show you a departure into the files section. And so there's this narrator who's this main character, so to speak, this nameless narrator. And he's an old CIA operative who's reflecting on his life. And here we have him actually pulling the Ajax files off of a bookshelf and looking at them. And what's so cool is that you can actually explore these files in a first-person view as if you were him. And so this is our way of weaving that right into the narrative. If you actually tap in the center of the screen, pull up the menus and hit the file section, top right corner, up pops this portrait version of the app. And inside of that you can see dossiers on each of the main characters. And so here's one on Churchill. And I thought this was a really cool way to bring history into the app in a way that was sort of a nice departure. It's almost like a, a transmedia experience all self-contained, right? So, you know, this is um, one section of the app designed entirely to just show you supplemental information in a really cool and engaging way as if you were the narrator uh, looking through these files yourself. And there's a pretty wide cast here of characters. So, you know, we have all these Iranians, you know, the Shah, for example. And I thought this was a great way to just add background information um, that was engaging, interactive, that would make people curious, but without overwhelming them. And it was a real challenge to make sure that we didn't put too much text in, because it was very easy to just copy and paste in many, many lines of, uh, of text into the app. Here's uh, Truman. So again, you can browse these photos. These are all Wikimedia Commons. We were really lucky in being able to uh, find content we could use uh, without having to license, uh, license it. So this is cool. This folder has actual declassified CAA documents in it. This is the original Q plan that was declassified in 2000. And I don't know how well you can see it in the video here, but there's a Photoshop background into these to make them look a little more uh, interesting. Because <laughs> they're black and white mimeographed uh, scans, they're pretty ugly. So we uh, put in a paper background to make them look a little sexier. But this is the actual coup plan. It's eight pages long and it talks about how to overthrow Iran's government. Uh, we also have an assessment of the Iranian situation. This was released internally right after the coup was foiled the first time. And so it's cool to see actual documents uh, that talk about this stuff. And of course, the newsreels, uh, we won't open those now but gives you an idea of what's contained inside. So again, there's Redacted's office, right? And those were the files that were actually being explored, and that's what it looks like in the comic. I'm going to fast forward now to a session of the Red Scare. So this just kind of showcases some of our best animation and uh, sound. This is a really cool two-page spread.
Tyler kind of indulged that one a little bit. And so what's cool is after this, we depart right into uh, newsreel footage, and you can sort of see how it ties together into the app. So this is Eisenhower getting elected. It was election year in America, and Adlai Stevenson, former governor of Illinois, became the standard bearer of an enthusiastic Democratic Party at its Chicago convention. A short time later, the Republican convention met at San Francisco and made short work of its nomination. Their choice by acclamation was President Eisenhower. As returns rolled in on election night, the this is really cool. Never in doubt. It was a landslide for the Eisenhower Nixon ticket. Let's check out Eisenhower's arms at the end here. He does this sort of double victory raise, right? And then on the next page of the comic, we go right into him in the same pose. And I thought that was really cool, the way of weaving those two things together. So, I don't know if I still need sound, but I'll just plug this in anyway. Cool. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of other aspects of the app. Um, so, I came up with this dynamic composition to arrange the panels in a really cool way. Uh, at first, we weren't sure what tool we were going to use for that, um, because we knew that Flash wasn't going to work on iOS devices. And back in 2010, there was like, what tool do we use? I mean, you know, you need a multi-timeline editor to do this kind of stuff. Um, if any of you guys work in motion graphics or in activity in general, which you probably all do, right? Um, you're going to know that that just doesn't work. And so uh, we tried to use Maya at first, thinking that maybe we'll be able to export the data and that's going to work, and it was terrible. Maya doesn't have a multi-timeline editor and it doesn't do all these other things uh, you know, in real time very well. Um, primarily, we need to translate, rotate, scale, alpha, and tint. And so I actually ended up using Flash to mock up the very first uh, chapter because I needed to do a lot of creative exploration. And so I think the lesson from that is that sometimes you just don't have the right tool at the right time, so just go play and figure it out and you'll be able to catch up later. This is a photo, Photoshop mock-up of what my pre-planning looks like when it comes to planning out some of this animation. And so what I do is I give this to my animators, and they're able to uh, go off of this. This is sort of a beat-by-beat -beat flow through Photoshop of me just taking the print comics and breaking them up into these compositions. And you know, the most minimal of direction to show how that stuff slides off. And so that page is interesting because it actually has two scenes on it. And I'm like, well, why not just leverage that? We can infinitely lay out the content however we want now because there's no limitations. It's not like we have to print more pages. And so this is what that composition sort of became uh, later in the book after um, being flowed through Photoshop. Uh, a note on sound, right? It's a reading experience first and foremost. And uh, you want just enough sound to fill in the gaps. You, know, you don't ever want to go silent unless you want to make a dramatic point. And you want to figure out when to use room tone, when to use music, when to use sound effects. And what I found at the end of the day is that you just need enough audio to make it work. And I think that um, you know, the guy who was working with us came from a film background. And it's really tempting. They want to keep pushing it more and more. Um, but again, it's the art of restraint. It's really about just enough to make it work. And, um, and that's actually beneficial because it also makes it less expensive and faster to, uh, to create. Uh, the value of user experience. Um, so we had kind of ignored this for a really long time, and it really hurt <laughs> first time around. We had spent all of our energy on making the story awesome and making sure the art looked great and making sure the interactivity was really, uh, was really cool, but we didn't really focus on how people were going to access this as a piece of software. Um, and you know, all you have to do is user test once. I'm sure this is like obvious to a lot of people, but um, when you're making anything interactive, you've got to be accounting for the fact that it's going to be on a device that doesn't have buttons. And trying to get people used to turning the page and all this other stuff, I think it's better now, um, but it really took a while to make that work. Um, when I think about uh, you know, sort of the layers of, of how people access an experience like this, you know, at the core of it is a story. If you don't have a good story, what's the point of all the other things? right? You need good story, then you need good presentation, so all the art and sound and animation and whatnot. Um, and then on top of that, of course, is the interface. So you're basically creating an awesome UX to provide a great presentation to what ultimately should be a great story. If the story is weak, it's not going to really add any value to, uh, to what you're doing. Um, enhanced content, the black hole of the ebook. <laughs> I think this has been discussed a lot. Uh, the question is, how do you add content to a, a book and enhance it when you can add infinite content? Uh, it becomes a really dicey proposition because you, temptation is to just dump everything in there. And learning where to draw the line is really hard. Um, you can layer in books within books within books within films within etc. So, um, you know, I just showed you guys sort of the technique in the desktop. Really figuring out where to draw the line to make people curious but not give them the whole story um, is important. And I think the reason that that's important is because at the end of the day, what you want them to do is become curious. You want them to actually go pick up Stephen Kinzer's book or go watch a documentary or go on Wikipedia or find all these other sources that document this stuff. And so um, basically, I call it the power of tangential learning. And to me, what that means is it's a tune drill down. 
it's something that's going to make you, you know, just get curious enough to want to go one level deeper. Um, it kind of looks like this, right? So um, at the core experience is the comic, which means that if all you're going to do is read the comic, um, you need to make sure that that's a complete experience, that it gives you all the information you need so that if that's all you do, you're going to know who the people were and what the times and dates were. We had to go back and edit things to make sure that, uh, you know, people were calling each other by names a little more often than not so that you knew who they were and things like that. And then the curiosity takes you one level deeper and you're going to pull up a, a document or, or um, a, a reel and then from that, hopefully, you'll want to actually go off and start digging around on your own. Um, it's like drinking from a fire hose. If you just give everybody all the information at once, they're going to they're gonna tune out. So um, I think that's really important for building that stuff in the future. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, you guys uh, may not be able to tell, but Ajax is actually built in Unity. Uh, it's, it's actually a game engine under the hood driving the entire experience. It's all real-time 3D. We didn't really get a chance to explore that because we were so busy just trying to get this thing done with basic, you know, flat animation, which I think is still pretty profound. But there's a lot of room for experimentation here, right? What does it mean when a game engine is driving a comic book? Well, there's a lot of opportunity to explore, and I'm looking forward to digging into that soon. Um, but in terms of just the larger idea of what our media is doing, I mean, the app space is now intersecting with your television in your living room, right? And so it makes me wonder, you know, as we transition out of this sort of handheld modality to a space where, you know, you suddenly have big budget console games existing, what's that overlap going to look like? And what does it mean when our experiences can be built in a game engine? You know, basically, we're now seeing AirPlay allow us to connect our mobile devices to our TVs and the whole living room uh, ecosystem is changing in reaction to this. And um, I don't know, it's both terrifying and exciting. Uh, one of the reasons why I find it personally terrifying is that there's some pretty extreme barriers here, at least for us. Um, as you guys know, the App Store is typically a 99 cent or a freemium experience, and we should really be an EPUB or a book. If this was a printed uh, book, it would be a $20 commodity, right? And there would be a tangible analog uh, thing to compare it to. Um, but EPUB doesn't support crazy technology. It doesn't support game engines and all the bells and whistles. And so we're at a bit of a disconnect um, in terms of consumer expectation right now, in terms of how people value this stuff. And so all the other people experimenting and pioneering, they're awesome. They're, we're all kind of like taking one for the, for the team, so to speak, because it's going to, I think this stuff is eventually going to be very successful, but um, we need support from Apple and we need support from Android and we need, um, you know, an ability to market our content correctly. Uh, the flip side to all of this is that you also have the console era, right? The iPad 3 just got announced. It's got crazy 3D capabilities and it can probably rival the consoles or start to. And, you know, that uh, ecosystem of games is a $60 experience and it's siloed, right? Not everybody can publish there. <clears throat> so it makes me wonder what's going to happen when all these things start to converge. You know, as people say, they don't really want uh, in-app purchases in their console games. So <laughs> anyway, uh, so I just wanted to recap, uh, incorporating the lessons of Stradivarius. Uh, you know, if we hadn't made a traditional comic book first, uh, we never would have, thank you, uh, we never would have been able to make a successful digital experience, I don't think. And again, the question for all of you guys that I have is how do we, how do we maintain the value of these like, beautiful traditions you know, of the past as we go forward and pioneer the future? Um, I just want to add that we're working with, uh, with BoomGen. I'm really excited about that, to really turn this into um, you know, a game and uh, an ed educational resource. And so if anybody has any questions about this stuff, um, you know, I'd be happy to talk to you after. But uh, if you want to come to the mics, that's basically it. Uh, we're 40 minutes, 42, so thanks so much. I, th I think so. Um, how are you guys handling file size? Mm. Mm. It's an interesting point. I mean, Ajax is 407 megs right now. Uh, one of the challenges that we faced, not just from a file size download perspective, but also from a um, just it's a game engine, so we had to figure out how to compress our images and stuff, and that was pretty difficult. So uh, I don't really have advice for that. I think that we're going to see the the storage space on these things just keep going up. You know, we're at 64 gigs, and I think that, you know, eventually that'll be, like, the smallest iPad you can buy. And I don't, need, I don't know if our content's going to keep ballooning beyond that. I think the most sensitive issue right now for iOS um, is the 20 megabyte download limit um, because that, I think, is really where you get the most impact. Um, I think that at the end of the day, I mean, it kind of goes back to the bookshelf, right? 
apps are temporary. You kind of just delete them when you're done with them, and there's nothing to show for it afterwards. And I'm more concerned about that versus the space thing than I am about, oh, how are we going to fit all this stuff on there? Um, but I think that it's a good point. It depends on what you're trying to create. If you're doing a serialized thing, then that's, you know, obviously you're going to have to contend for that. My name's Christopher Allen. I have a, a new app for authors to be able to create infinite canvases. Much easier um, than what you're trying to do, but it doesn't do as much. Um, the, uh, how big is the team that did this is my, maybe my first question. The second hmm. thing, did you consider any kind of nonlinear narrative? Okay, two-part question. So first part, how big is the team? Um, well, the largest part was the artists. We used a lot of, we had about 60 people in total work on this. Um, mostly because we kept trying to experiment to find the best way to produce our content. Uh, at the end of the day, the team that worked the best for us uh, was an on-site team uh, in San Francisco headed by Sergio Paez, and they were about five guys. So if, if you were to use that team going forward, um, you could probably do it with a team of about 10 people, um, but it was about 60 total that worked on this book. Uh, so it was, a, it was a big experiment, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and then in terms of branching storyline, um, so you're talking, I think Choose Your Own Adventure is where I go when I think about that. Everyone usually asks about that. I loved those books when I was a kid. You'd like jam like six fingers into the things. You could go back. <laughs> I'm going to get it right this time. Um, it's cool. I think you can do it with text really easily, but the moment you start to add illustrations or any sort of like labor-intensive content, there's a big risk. And I know in games the big um, sort of point that holds us back is that there's a, there's a big chance your audience is never going to see that content, right, if you're not going to play through it multiple times and try going in those directions. And so it's sort of hard to justify uh, from a financial perspective. I think with comics there's maybe less of a concern of that because it's a lot less expensive to support branching narrative with content. It's one of the benefits of comics, actually, is that it's relatively inexpensive to produce you know, illustrations. Um, where I think it's the most successful is where you branch right at the end of a, of a chapter or at the end of a, an episode of a, of a gameplay experience. And from there, um, you, know, you can have a win-lose scenario that sort of changes your outcome for the next thing. I encourage you to look at not just choose your own adventure, but change your point of view. So hmm. follow the detective or follow the murderer. All right. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Calvin Reed from Publishers Weekly. I'd um, uh, I'd love to. Yes. Anyway, love the presentation. It was uh, really great. Uh, you know, I, I'm just curious about um, the structure. I, I think you told me about it one time about uh, selling it by chapters. And uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> and 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 how much? Uh, uh, how did? How how much of an audience did you were you able to, to get for the? Uh, well, for the, the first app, you mean? Yeah. Okay, so for those who don't know, we actually did a release of this in uh, December of 2010, and it was totally premature, and we learned a lot of lessons about when you're supposed to come out with something and when you shouldn't. Like, if you only have two chapters out of ten available, don't release your thing. Uh, and if you have bad UX, don't release your thing. Um, yeah, and if the story's confusing, don't release your thing. So... Uh, so we had like, kind of like a reboot of sorts in November, but um, the original strategy was to release like a chapter for free and then say, okay, cool, here's a chapter for free, now please buy the next one for whatever amount of money. Um, I'm not, I don't think that that fails necessarily, um, but I think that just the way comics are structured, at least for our book, you need to have episodic content from the get-go. You need to really leave them with like, a ridiculous cliffhanger and like sell the crap out of it in the first chapter or else it's like they're kind of left hanging and they might not go for it, right? And I don't know, there's, all, there's like a flip mentality to that. Like, the more money I put into this, the more invested I get, right? It's kind of like the Mafia Wars, like, craziness. You know, it must be worth money, because I spent money on it. So here's more of my money. And then it's just kind of, you know. Um, but I don't really think that graphic novels work that way. I think it's kind of like, if someone slaps down their eight bucks or whatever, they're in it for the ride. They're like, well, they might get a little rough in patches, but God damn it, I committed my eight dollars, so now I want to see that, you know, financial commitment through. Um, I think that there's different ways to balance it. I think we're all experimenting right now. I mean, maybe you give away half the book for free and then you charge for the second half. Or maybe you give away all of it except for the last chapter and really maybe piss people off. I don't know. Um, but there's, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it. And uh, um, I th we're going actually after, we're going to do a light version next uh, and a phone version next, which is really cool. So if you guys have iPhones, it miniaturizes amazingly well. Um, and I think that what's cool about that is you can actually give someone a single chapter that's really powerful and has a really strong call to action and actually leverages all the benefits of mobile. Um, but we didn't really pay attention to the mobile uh, sort of like mentality at first, and that was a huge downside uh, for us at the beginning. Hey. Um, I was wondering what's your opinion now that you've, you've completed this like big project with a large team. Where do you think this is going to go in the future for like maybe – Smaller scale projects like a webcomic, considering 
launching itself as an app instead of as a web comic from like an independent producer, do you think it will scale well enough to the small scale for like one person or like even a small team of like two or three people to develop? No, oh, yeah. I mean, it depends on the scale, the scale and scope of what you want to do. I mean, Ajax was like the the I call it the Tijuana Supremo package to rip off Aqua Teen Hunger Force. It's a, uh, it's just like you know we overindulge the animation so much, and it's beautiful and it's awesome. But I think that there's definitely a line of impact. I mean, I'm an artist, so I tend to value things based on their aesthetics and based on their artisanal qualities. And um, especially in the mobile space, the bar is not actually that high in a lot of places. So um, you can find a balance. And I think that um, if, you're, if you're coming at it from the comics creator's perspective, it's really more about story and some great illustrations and something that's really fun to read and less about all this you know, bang whiz, flash, cool, look at me stuff. Um, there's, there's levels you can do it with. I think that as the tools evolve, yes, you can. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think it's impossible. I think it's hard now, but it's going to get easier. Height difficulties. Um, I have two questions. One, the first one is, I know that you were trying to maintain the authenticity of the comic, but I kind of have to wonder, considering that the format is completely different, you don't need to obey page. Why did you choose to obey page and, and while keeping the panel format and basically a continuous scroll versus um, pages? Well, we actually had a technical limitation. Uh, it's a game engine at its core, so we're under real-time limitations. And so it was actually really convenient that the page gave us this break because what that does is it allows the, the iPad to dump all the content out of memory and actually load in the next set of texture maps and geometry. Um, so that's not to say that you couldn't improve that in the future. If you guys ever, a lot of people here probably play video games, I imagine. Remember when Tony Hawk went to like open world and you could like skate forever and it was like, you know, maybe you'd skate through a tunnel, but it was like continuous versus like loading the next thing. And you can, there's different approaches and I'm, I'm sure that you can pick an aesthetic that, that matches. Um, I actually liked aesthetically the page break. I think it was kind of a cool change of scene. Um, but if you're not changing a scene and you're just continuing a scene across multiple pages, I think that then that's when you would continue to roll the, the panels up or down or left to right. Okay, and then my second question was, you hear a lot of talk um, about, I'm a digital marketer by trade, not an artist, but I, so I hear a lot of talk about people who want to plug in advertising or link to the web or tons of other stuff um, into written works. And I was wondering, as a creator, what your thought would be if somebody said, well, you can get sponsored by Coca-Cola if that Coke machine is actually enables you to buy a Coke. <laughs> well, yes, you can do all of that stuff. Um, I mean, I'm not going to call like right or wrong on that. I think it just depends on what you want to create, right? Um, I think that you're looking at comics as a tool for storytelling for whatever that story is. I think brands... I was just having this conversation last night over drinks with this guy who's like, would you do commercial work? Wink, wink. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I guess... You know, I'm not like, oh boy, I'm going to tell the story of Coke. But I think that there's, there's all sorts of opportunities there to really, you know, to, lever to make things more engaging in general. Like, I actually have a deep appreciation for a good advertisement. Like, if you can make me laugh or, or make me profoundly think about something in like 15 to 30 seconds, that's amazing. And that's like, you know, that's the film version of that. But why not have an interactive experience that does that as well, or a comic space one? I think that there's all these tools coming together. And as our attention gets further divided up and we're constantly pushing things out of the way to like just focus on our, you know, whatever it is we're doing, our Twitter or whatever, right? Um, if you can actually like make something worth my time and engage me and, and impact me, then I'll respect you as a brand more, perhaps. And I think that there's value in, in looking at that. And I'm actually really excited to push the gaming and the interactive technology, because that's my background. And so it's like, now I feel like I have a good enough wrangle on comics. I know that it's really hard. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I really like pushing the 3D camera and being able to like look at how you can actually take that, that format and make it go further. So uh, when we walked in, I heard Pink Floyd playing, and when I was younger, um, I bought an album, I would listen to it, you know, on vinyl. A lot of people don't even know what albums are these days, but, uh, you know, I'd listen to it and it was a concept and it was put together much like what I'm seeing here. And now everything, I have a 15 year old and everything is so snackable and it's so short and the attention pan is so short and he wants quick things all the time. Can you give us a little bit of insight on what the demographics are for something like this and what's mm -hmm. more important, the, the format, the length, the content? Um, are you trying to reach an, a younger audience? Is that going to become a problem with, with a graphic novel that's this size? It's a good question. Um, well, originally I wanted to try to bring Stephen Kinzer's story to like 17-year-olds. <laughs> Because, uh, I mean, let's face it, if everyone read more books, just generally speaking, I think we'd all be in a better place. But, um, you know, 
it turns out that I, I think that young people, when they see it, are, are interested in this. But you know, one of the reactions is like, "Well, that's not Harry Potter," and I'm like, Ugh. you know, like. <laughs> Or like, wow, the story's really boring. And I'm like, I know, there's history at the beginning. I'm sorry. Like, you know, let's just please. So it's a challenge. And I think that you're going to constantly have to adjust for multiple, uh, you know, targets, right? Like if someone's young, yeah, there's just certain topics that are going to be harder to engage them on. But the format itself, I think, is super legit. I think that people, when they read it for the first time, uh, get really sucked in and, are, and think it's really cool. So, um, I mean, you could tell any story this way. You know, you could tell, take any major IP and you could, like, you know, skin it and do stuff with it. And I think that there's all sorts of new ways to make that engaging. Um, so I think as long as people find the story interesting um, or find what they're doing with it interesting and they're not constantly being bombarded by, like, you know, all the other things that compete in our electronic, you know, digital consciousness, um, I think it would be fine for both young and old people and even the people in between. <laughs> no more questions, really? No one's, no one's going to come up and, like... Yeah. <laughs> so when I was a kid, one of the main things that sort of made me not like reading comics was not the stories or how beautiful it was drawn. It was there's just too much information on the page, and I always felt like there was something out of the corner of my eye that was distracting. And so I feel like this really, in a lot of ways, solves that problem. Mm. So I was wondering if that was intentional or if it was just... Happy accident. I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story. So it was Watchmen motion comics, and as much as I knock them, it still it still gave me an idea. And this, I guess, it came out of Kirby Ferguson's like remix everything thing the other day, right? Like good artist steal. I, I effing stole from like the Watchmen <laughs> motion. Like I'm, I'm bit, they, I still don't. You know, I still think what we did is better. I mean, I do. But what it was is I I read the, the Watchmen graphic novel and I consumed it so fast. I'm like, oh boy, a book, you know, and just like constantly. You don't even stop to take in the illustrations. And I'm like, that was okay. It was kind of old, you know, like it was made in the 80s. And then I watched the movie, and I'm like, that was okay. It was kind of like a recreation of the book, and it was really long, and still kind of felt like it was made in the 80s. And then I like went on iTunes, and I like pulled up the motion comic, because I was curious. And, you know, the guy's voice was hilarious. That's kind of why he's like doing like, oh, I'm a woman, no, I'm a guy, you know, and they're like talking. And then, um, but what was so amazing to me is that um, it made me slow down and totally see one panel at a time. It's a video experience. You can't, like, speed through it. And I got the syncing up of, um, you know, Al Alan Moore's writing with, with the illustrations, Dave Gibbons' um, illustrations. And it was so profound. I didn't actually get how good it was because I was, like, not paying attention. I wasn't honoring uh, the experience. And what I thought was, like, wow, that really made me, like, stop and appreciate the pairing of those two things. And... How cool would it be if I could create something that had all the benefits of, like, you know, reading a book, you know, and incorporated motion and video? So that, it was intentional. I wanted to slow you down and really make you see. And once I had you starting and stopping along the way, I'm like, ha, are you curious about this guy? Because there's a thing you can click right there. And you can't really do that in film, right? Like, you're kind of like, if you watch a documentary, you're like, oh, I'm so engaged, and boy, I just want to, like, tear away to, like, look up a thing. And then maybe it ends, you're like, well, now I'm depressed, and I need to go, like, out to dinner with my boyfriend, and <laughs> I won't actually go back and do that now. You know, there's, there's different opportunities in a reading experience versus a film one. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think this is the short answer to that question. Awesome. Well done. This works as a follow-up to that, actually, because I was curious. I know you were saying that it was very important to you all to respect the art of a comic as a reading experience, but then you also had some of those inserts that were like the newsreels. Mm -hmm. and. Do you think that there might come an opportunity, or did you all stop yourselves from like putting a cinematic sequence, like the way it is in like a video game? Because ah. like you can still, I mean, like you could do it Zelda style, and like nobody has to talk, and you could still respect the fact that nobody, <laughs> there's no dialogue. Eight bit so. most of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. maybe. So. No, it's true. Well, I think that the moment you know the newsreels are very obviously not the comic, right? It's a departure, and I feel like my expectations change when that comes up. And because it's a video, I'm like, oh, well, I can just skip this, boop. But I'm not going to skip any part of the comic, right? Right. So I think it's, as long as you make it intentional, like, if the aesthetics had matched, um, like, for example, actually the very first time we did the book, another problem uh, with the first time we released the book, uh, it was really inconsistent when you would tap forward. You'd, like, tap, and sometimes it would, like, play through and then pause awkwardly and then keep going, and you'd be like, wait, am I... Now I'm just confused. Why am I, okay, this is too hard. And you just, you know. So that actually broke the experience. What actually worked from a user testing perspective, user testing, very, very important, tap once and always have the same amount of time go by. And I get into a rhythm, and there's expectation there, and that's how you go buttonless, right? That's how you know when to go and when to stop. 
So um, yes, you can do it. The risk there is that you can potentially break the user's expectations and break the user experience. So that's why we chose not to. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, Daniel. Thank you. It was really an amazing panel, and uh, I'm, I'm privileged to come up here and ask you a question. Uh, my name is John. I have flyers. I have cards, so you guys can... <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so I, I come from a background in 3D animation. I worked at a company here on a game, Freelancer, and then another one that got canceled. I'm uh, self-producing a short web series with 3D animation and kind of cell animation. It's called Space Adventure, and I'm doing this kind of show to bring back space and, and all this stuff and make it entertaining for kids. So I'm, I'm a one-person studio, and I've done all the work, mm. and uh, I'm wanting to parlay what I'm doing into an iPad application and kind of make, bring the, uh, make it edutainment. And so what you've done is you've, you've taken an entertaining, you've taken a, a, a historical story, and you've made it entertaining in a, in, a, in, a, in a graphic novel format. So in doing so, what were the challenges in, in making an engaged and compelling story and then keeping it authentic to the history? And, uh, and, then, and then the second question is, how are you going to incorporate 3D uh, application into the next version of that? Ah, well, T TBD on the 3D application. Oh, okay. We're actually not going to do a historical story to do that because I just want to go after the tech now. And actually, it's because of the challenge of writing a fun, engaging, historically accurate story that I'm not doing that because that is what used up all of our time. We were constantly like misspelling people's names, and the Farsi was backwards, and like all these things where I'm like, I can't actually do that. I don't know what I'm, you know, I can make it look pretty, but can I actually make it accurate? It was like I had to take on all these different roles, and oh, it was exhausting. It was just so much work. Um, so I think you know we we're constantly like I wouldn't say arguing with Stephen Kinzer, but we'd be like, it's like this, and he's like, well, it was a telegram, not a phone call, and we're like, who cares? Like that's not an important part of the plot like you know it's there's like bigger problems to be solving than like whether the guy called him or sent him a telegram and so every plot point of the story required like that like back and forth with steven and i mean we conceded on a lot of stuff that's why we have all this history at the beginning but um you know so it's this constant wrestling match between like make it interesting and make it fun and i no matter what the format is whether it's a movie or what you know or a video game uh you know plot or whatever it is you're always going to have that challenge and i guess my hope is that the more tools you have to convey, um, the easier you can make it um, flow and be fun and engaging, right? Like, we had to create a narrator. I knew that right at the very beginning. And then by making him historically fictitious, we can, like, put him all these places that, like, a real person might not actually be. And by me keeping him nameless, his name was supposed to be redacted from one of the documents. It turns out all the names that were redacted were actually Iranians, but, eh. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, it, so it, there's, just, there's different vehicles uh, for not only just in narrative-based, uh, you know, uh, visual storytelling, but also in adding, you know, documents, interactivity, and things like that that allow you to supplementally add in information so that you can get the full the full ramp, right? Which is why I said the core comic story has to satisfy, but then, like, for the Snickers bite or whatever, going deep down into the layers, like the peanuts or whatever are the, I don't know, the caramels below. It's a thing. Anyway. Uh, so so th thank you. And uh, one, one last comment is I'd love to see a documentary about what you guys did because uh, it, it took you over three years, right, to make this? Yeah, this is actually the beginning of year five. Wow, year five? Well, anyway, congratulations and keep it going. I'm very inspired. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I'd like to think that I'm that interesting that we would make a documentary. Hey, Dan, Daniel, hey, thanks. Great stuff. Love your process. Like to uh, see the exhibition. I'm a documentary filmmaker who's also working on for two years a doc, uh, for four years, and also an ebook. So, what tip would you give to documentary makers who want to bring animation in? to um, the ebook format to tell their story based on what you know about animation. The tune drill down. Don't overwhelm people with information. Uh, make, it, make them get curious and then give them a piece that kind of like, it's like a leaving a trail of M&Ms to you know, Gargamel's house or whatever. Like, with Gargamel's house being a place of knowledge and goodness. But the idea that... <laughs> you, should you should tweet that one. That'll get retweeted like now. Anyway, um, but that's the idea. It's like you're leaving them clues and crumbs. And so at the, at the core of it, I'm entertained and I'm enjoying myself. And then, you know, it's not that curiosity is a bad thing or not fun, but you want to you give people an opportunity to, like, now that they're not worried about being entertained, they're worried about learning something. And that's a huge disconnect, yeah. especially in the mobile space where it's like, this isn't Angry Birds. What is this? Oh, it's about Iran. I'm not sure if I like this, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what we're up against. Right. Um, but I think that, you know, once you can be like, ha I've got your attention. Now you're going to follow me over here. And then, you know, at the end of it, you're like, that was really amazing. And now I'm really sad. And now I want to know how I potentially can, like, learn more about, you know, say, this particular topic or whatever it is you're trying to tell a story about. Um, we're over by a minute 11 seconds. I'd love to keep talking to you guys. Um, so I guess... 
what are we allowed to do? Am I allowed to I obviously not stand up here and be mic'd? Nothing outside? Okay, I guess I'll be over there. Thanks for coming. Sure.